Hello and welcome back. In our previous video, we understood how Spark handles shuffle data. Today we will see how Spark works with data persistence. We will see what are cache and persist methods. We will understand how caching works in Spark. We will also see what are the different level of data persistence or caching in Spark. Now, if you have not seen our previous videos, I will recommend you to go back and watch our playlist. I am in my JupyterLab environment. Today we will work with sales data. Before we can begin, let's view the data that we are going to use today for our demonstration. So for that, I'll write head and I have a file called new sales.csv. If I run this, you can see the columns that are in the CSV file. We have multiple columns like transacted data, transaction ID, retail ID, description, amount and city ID. This file is approximately of 700 MB and it has around 7.2 million records. We'll try to cache this file and see the behavior of Spark today when we try to read the data from this particular piece of file. Now that we know the data we are going to work, let me start with the Spark session. For this, I've just restricted the memory for our executor to 512 MB. I'll be using my local machine for this particular demonstration. Let me run this. Okay, our Spark session is ready. Let me go ahead and refresh the Spark UI. Nice, our Spark UI is up and running. Before that, I'll go into the environment tab and I'll see the memory that is set for this particular executor, which is equals to the 512 MB, which we have defined in the Spark session. Now, as already mentioned, we are going to read the sales CSV file, which is approximately of 512 MB of size and 7.2 million records are there in that sales file. If you see the schema, we have the schema defined for that particular sales file. What I have done is I put the amount column as table, rest all the columns as string for now. Let me go ahead and read this CSV file into a data frame. I'll name the data frame as TF. To read, I'll write spark.read.format, which is CSV. Dot. I'll specify the schema, which is underscore schema, and the option, which is header. Since we know we have a header in the file, I'll put it as true, and we will load the file, which is at data, data, and put new sales.csv. Now, before I run this, since I've already specified the schema, there will be no job created for reading this file. So let me run this. This has executed successfully. Let me go back and refresh the job tab. Nothing is there. Now, before we begin to understand cache or the caching mechanism in Spark, before that, let's view some of the records for this particular data frame. So what I'll do is I'll put a filter where the amount is greater than 300. So for that, I'll write df dot where we have a column called amount, which is greater than 300. I'll just make a so. If I run this, Okay, we get an output where the amounts are greater than 300. Let me go back and see what they are for this particular job. So we have this job completed. Let me expand this. Now, if you see this DAG, the first step is scan CSV. Well, it has scanned some of the rows for that particular output. So now we understand if we run it against the data frame, it is going to hit the CSV file every time. Let's begin with our caching mechanism. So to do that, First, you need to understand what happens when we do a cache for a particular data frame. To do a cache, you need to write df.cache. Now, if we run this, you can see output for a data frame. But if you go and see the storage, nothing is there. Even if you go back to the job, nothing is there. The reason is cache, you have to trigger an action. So that action can be count or write. The importance of count and write is count and write method will try to read the whole data frame rather than reading a partial data frame. Let me show you. If I put a count here and now if I run this, now that we got the output for the count, let me go back and refresh the storage tab. If I come back and refresh the storage tab, you can see the cache is created. But notice the storage level. It is disk memory and deserialized. So whenever we specify the cache for PySpark, the default is disk and memory and this is deserialized. Notice one more thing here. Some of the data is in memory and some is spilled to disk. The reason is we have a data set which is greater than the memory of that executor. Now, if I go back and if you see this cache now, let me run the same query, which is the filter query from this cache. So what I'll do is I'll copy this query now and I'll run it again. Now, if you see this has completed so quickly this time, let me go back and open the SQL data frame tab. You see the difference? First time it took around 2 seconds. Now it completed in 0.2 seconds because this is reading from in memory. Let me show you the DAG. If you see this, the scan CSV, the number of output rows is 0 because this execution has not hit the CSV. Rather, it has hit the in memory table scan, which is the cache we just created now. Now, 
let me go back so we know this cache has created in memory and disk and this is what is the storage level for the data frame and data set in PySpark. So if you run cache in data frame and data set in PySpark, the default storage level is memory and disk. But for RDD, it is memory only. Now, there's one more question. Consider we create a data frame out of cache and try to do the count of that particular data frame. And then we try to read the original data set with the filter condition. What will happen in that case? Before we do that, let's remove the cache first. So to remove the cache, you need to write df.unpersist. If we run this, again we get a data frame. Now, let me go back and go to the storage tab. See, the cache is removed. Let's go through our example. Consider we create a data frame df cache here. And rather than doing count here, we will do the count of dh cache. So, I'll remove this here. And in the next step, I'll do df underscore cache dot count. Now, after this, if we try to read from the original data set, which was df, what will happen in that case? Take a moment and try to guess. Let's see what happens. So, I'll run this cell first. Nothing will happen because to cache, we need to run the count. So, we'll run the count again. Now, since we got the count, it means our data is cached. Now, it is not necessary that you only need to do a count. You can also write the data set with no operations format that we have discussed in our last session, if you remember. So let me go back and see the storage level. Yes, our data set is again persisted. You can see the same deserialized and this time again, the memory and disk data is there. So let me go back and this time I'll again run this where query. But this time we will refer the original data frame, which is df rather than referring the df cache. So what will happen in this case? Let me run this. You see, we have got the data instantly. If I go back and if I refresh this SQL data tab, you see the source string. And again, this has completed in 0.1 second. So we can understand that this is running from cache. Let me go back and see this. See the scan CSV is zero. Again, this is an in-memory table scan. So this is how Spark understands. Spark keeps a lineage and knows whenever you cache a data and you refer the original data frame, it will try to read the data from cache rather than reading it from the original data source. So in this case, even if we trigger any query against the original data frame, which was DF, it will try to refer the cache. And this is the reason why it is always told that the cache should be done properly. Consider a case where you have done the cache on a particular piece of data. Let me put a filter here. Say you put the cache as amount greater than 100. So let me first unpersist the data. Now, if I go back and if I refresh, cache is gone so let me come back now if i cache here you can see the cache will happen on partial data where is the amount greater than 100 let me run this and let me again run the count now you can see a different count here because this is on the filter data let me go back and refresh the storage tab you can see this time it has fitted all the data in memory because the data volume was less there is no spillage on disk now if i come back and if i do an amount which is greater than 50 for example because we have done a filter on amount greater than 100. What if I do an amount greater than 50 on the original data frame? Let me run this. It has completed successfully. Let me go back and refresh this. Let me go to the source string. You can see this time it has hit the CSV file. The reason is the filter has triggered a partial cache. So now if you point the original data source, that cache will be invalidated and Spark will again read the data from the original source, which is the CSV file. And in this case, you can see there is no reading from cache happening. It is reading from the CSV file and it is going down to the collect limit. If you want, you can see the job as well. Let me go to the job. If you see, there is no cache involved. It has invalidated the cache. So if we go to the storage tab, you can see we have an amount greater than 100 filter because that is what we have created. But if we put a different filter, which is greater than 50 on the original data source, Spark will direct read the data from the original source. And this is why partial cache is very dangerous if you are not doing it properly. Now that we have understood how Spark works with caching with full data set and a partial data set, let's see the different storage level involved with caching. Now, if you can see on my screen, there are multiple storage levels that are involved with caching. Now, for cache, we know the default is in PySpark, memory and disk, and that for data frame. But if you want a different setting, you can use the persist method. To do it, for example, we can write df underscore persist. And we can use the original data frame, which is df dot persist. 
and in this we can specify storage level to do that first we need to import PySpark so I'll write import PySpark and now we can specify the storage level so we'll write PySpark dot storage level dot the storage level we need for example consider we need memory only for that we can put it like this memory only but before we can do that let me unpersist the existing cache so I'll run this if I go back and refresh storage the cache is still there to remove all the cache you can write spark dot catalog dot clear cache if i run this and if i go back and refresh again you see all cache is gone now if, let me run this and if i come back nothing will happen because we have not triggered any action so let me trigger the action so i'll write df persist dot this time i'll use the no operation right so i'll write write dot format and we will use the no op and we know that no op will do nothing it will just simulate so i'll write overwrite and dot save so if i trigger this let me go back and run the storage and this time you can see the memory is serialized the reason is cache puts the data is unserialized but if you put it with persist the memory the data will be serialized in the memory and you can see the size of the data is 217 MB in memory. There is no spillage on disk. Now, there's one more thing that you might be thinking. How did Spark fit all the data in memory right now? Because in last time when we saw that in cache, it was spilling some data to disk. The reason is the data here is serialized. So you have to be very sure when you see this. For cache, the data was unserialized. This is why the data was getting spilled to disk. But when Spark is encoding this in JVM serialized method, it is putting every data in memory because it is able to do that. Now, what will happen if Spark storage setting is memory only and the data is still not able to fit in memory? And that will be a time where you will see an out of memory error. So be very sure of the storage level setting you have mentioned in your jobs. It is very important the size of data that needs to be fit in. If your size of data is greater than the memory that you have specified, always remember to use memory and disk. Now, for memory only serialization, this is for Scala or Java jobs. For PySpark, whenever we do memory only or memory and disk, by default, the data is serialized. So you cannot use memory only serialization or memory and disk serialization in PySpark. Now, what does this memory only do? Let's do it. Let's put memory only two here. And before that, let me clear the cache. So if I run this and go back and refresh, the cache is cleared. Let me run this and this time again the overwrite. Now, if we come back to the storage and refresh, you can see this is 2x replicated. It implies this is replicated twice in all the executors. Now, before we can conclude today's session, the important difference between cache and persist method you need to keep in mind. In persist method, you can define the storage level you need to use. And in cache, the default storage level is memory and disk and that too, the data is deserialized. I hope you have learned a lot today. If you like my content, make sure to like and subscribe. Till then, keep learning, keep growing, keep sharing.